Hi, and welcome to a new episode of the Go to a Podcast. I'm Jack Franchilli for Wahoo's 24 7. And just like I promised, we're having a Virginia men's and women's basketball episode. And I also promise a guest, and here he is, Daily Progress's Greg Medea. Yeah, so Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, ha- happy to do it, Jackie. The men's team is playing well. Women's team might be going the other direction, but but at least the men's team is playing really, really well. And at least there's still energy around the women's program. We've got to we've got to say a lot of people are still excited about the direction that program is going and the progress that's made. So at least we have that also for the for the women and um, the future looks bright for that program. But First, let's talk about the UVA men. I know it's been an eventful few days for us on the beat, Greg, but for the men, they're taking it easy this week. They've they've had no game um, since the weekend. They're taking much needed rest. So we get to evaluate what we've seen from them the last few games. And obviously the big talking point is Tony Bennett adjusting and going small. Ben Vanderplas has been starting the last few games and it's been very successful. It seems like it ignited the offense. The offense is now shooting 41.9% from three point range during this five game winning streak that they've had averaging about 10.4 points, uh, but sorry, 10.4 made threes per game. That's very good. And it seems to have made this team very exciting on offense, which is something that UVA fans are really, (laughs) really liking at this point. Yeah, you, you look at what they are this year on offense and what they've been, you know, as of late compared to last year. I think they were they're, they're up over 70 points per game this year. They were at like 62 points per game last season. So it's a it's a big big jump uh for Virginia's offense and then you pair it with that defense that's still very very good, yielding only about 60 points per game. Uh that's that's a big time recipe for success, but you're exactly right. The way they've gone to this this smaller looking lineup you saw it right after Armando Baycott got hurt in the North Carolina game is when you first saw Tony Bennett make some adjustment and he used, you know, the three guards, Clark, Beekman, and and Armand Franklin. Uh, plus you saw some of Isaac McNeely and then Vanderplas because Jaden Gardner had gotten in some foul trouble against the Tar Heels. And then you saw it again, uh, really the past couple of games. You know, at Florida State, he rolled with uh Ben Vanderplas in the starting lineup along with Jaden Gardner and the three guards. And it's been really good. You, you hear opposing coaches after games and they are are, are kind of impressed. They, they think Vanderplas has been a really good addition for Virginia, not only because he, he he's a veteran player, but because he has the ability to step out and make the three. Uh, did it early in that Florida State game. And I think with he and Armand Franklin shooting it the way they, they they've shot it, uh, recently, it's it's a really really tough matchup, and and one of the things Tony said, I couldn't remember when it was, but it was either maybe after the Virginia Tech game or after the Florida State game down in Tallahassee. He had said he he thinks that smaller lineup is really freeing up Franklin to do some different things and really allowing Franklin to make decisions, maybe either drive it to the basket or catch and shoot with some more space. Uh, and you, you've seen it, right? Franklin's been in double digits his last six games, but had 25 at Wake and had 20 at, at Florida State. So he's been really good lately. Yeah, actually, one of our stories that we wrote early on in the season, it, it showed that if Armand Franklin is having a good night or a good game, if UVA generally has a good game. He is really the key to how successful this team can be. And like you said, I, one thing that I've noticed from him offensively is he's not afraid to adapt in-game. Before, I think even last year, when his three ball wasn't falling, it felt like he didn't have the confidence. And obviously, he was playing hurt, too. But he didn't have the confidence to adjust to a different, I guess, shot or just go inside. And now that he's healthy, he has the good offensive support. And the way the small ball lineup works, he's been able to go inside. And we've seen him really be aggressive in attacking the rim, Greg. Yeah, and and he's been good on the glass, too. I think that's helped him create some second chance opportunities, not only uh, for, for himself, but for his teammates. And and I think it's just fit him really well. And one of the things I talked with him about earlier this season was, was just finding that shooting rhythm again. And it was a long off season, he said, but I uh, got to work with some NBA players uh, down in Florida, uh, including former UVA, you know, standout Justin Anderson. And, and they were able to figure some things out with his shot. 
And, and to me, I, I, I thought that that's a big part of why Franklin has helped himself improve. Uh, and then what you're seeing with the small ball lineup is, is Tony Bennett letting Armand Franklin uh, do some special things and, and letting him uh, play a little bit more freely. And I think, of course, when you, you're pairing him with with Kia Clark and Reese Beekman, Reese Beekman, who I, I think his health has a lot to do with their success too, right? You remember the Michigan game, turn the ankle a little bit. Uh, then the James Madison game, it was the hamstring, and you, you didn't see him for a little bit uh, with the hamstring injury uh, that, at the full burst that you're used to seeing him at. But you've seen it the last four or five games that he looks healthy, he looks ready to go. And when he drives the basketball, they are just so dangerous because Ben Ben Vanderplas can step out from three, and he can kick the ball out to Vanderplas, he can kick it out to Franklin, uh, he can find Jaden Gardner in that mid-range that Gardner's so good at. Uh, and I think you saw some of that against Virginia Tech. Uh, but with, with Beekman healthy, man, he he just – he's so good with the assist. And then he's also uh, really, really good at finishing at the rim at times when he decides to go up and take it like he did on that slam dunk against the Hokies at, right before the half. Yeah, and it also doesn't hurt when the ball security is so good with Clark, Beekman, and Franklin. I think there was one game they had one turnover among the three. So, But, you know, kind of moving from the small ball lineup, you see more opportunities for some of these guys, but we're seeing less opportunities for Caden Shedrick, who has not had much minutes the last few games. And, and Tony Bennett did address that during the Zoom call. And he, he said it's not a – there's always going to be opportunities for guys like Caden Chedrick and Tafaro and a lot of the other guys on the bench. Um, obviously, we've seen how Ryan Dunn has come up in the last few games. He's come up from the bench and has some integral defensive minutes for UVA. How do you see Caden Chedrick's role a change in the next few games as Virginia continues to move forward in the conference play? Yeah, it's it's really interesting because uh, what what Tony had said on that that ACC coaches Zoom is that. You know, he, he's trying to encourage Shedrick behind the scenes. The fact that he brought it up with the team, I think, speaks volumes because you don't want to lose Shedrick, right? At times, Shedrick has shown you some really good ability. I think, what is the Baylor game going back to when they played out in Vegas? He, he might have had 17 points in that game. Uh, and, of course, you, his, his ability to defend the rim is it's still a, a big-time game for Virginia when he's on the floor, right? It, it adds something to their defense that, that they don't have when he's, when he's not out there. Uh, so you don't want to lose Shedrick. So you, you make sure he knows he's still an important part of the team. But for, for now, and, and what I think is the most important thing is, Bennett said, if he's got chemistry with, with the smaller ball lineup, they're finding success with it. It's hard to go away from it, right? When you're finding all that, when you're finding all that success and you're playing well offensively, it's hard to, hard to move off of that when, when it's going good. And, and that's just a coach making a decision. But I think as far as Shedrick goes, He's got to keep working behind the scenes to improve some things offensively. And then and then maybe when he gets his chance, and you never know, it could come, right? Say, say Jaden Gardner or Ben, ben Vanderplas have some foul trouble, you know, in, in the next couple of games. You know, maybe there's an opportunity for Shedrick to to, to take advantage of and, and work his way and earn his way uh, back to some more minutes. I don't know if he'll get back into the starting lineup, but uh, maybe earn some more minutes. And I think, you know, you look at – what they have coming down the stretch and whether, whether it's the UNC game where they'll see uh, Armando Baycott, uh, assuming he, he's, he's still healthy, right? They missed seeing Armando in that, that first matchup because he got hurt in the first two minutes of the game. Uh, you, you might want Shedrick on the floor uh, when you, when you got to face Baycott, right? It's a totally different feel with UNC. And then even uh, BC on Saturday, they have a seven footer, Quinton Post, uh, great last name to play down low. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, you, you may want Shedrick to, to, to play some physical minutes and, and be tough against a big guy like that. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit more about that schedule, but you know, the schedule looks favorable for Virginia oh, yeah. and there's a lot of opportunities for Caden Shedrick to come off the bench. And I honestly, and I think that was media day this year that Bennett talked about how he liked his depth this year on the roster because it allowed to play versatile. And we're seeing that now, you know, he went yeah. small ball now. So he is. Is, he's very willing to adjust. That's a big thing with Tony Bennett this season. He's very willing to adjust to his opponents because he finally has that. He didn't have that last year. So this year he's finally able to adjust for the opponents. But we're going to take a quick break here, Greg. And then one away back, we're going to 
talk about um, Kihei Clark and Reese Beekman and how well they've been doing this season. And we're going to talk about the schedule and some women's hoops. So give us a few minutes and we'll be right back. And welcome back to the Good Old Podcast. I'm Jackie Franchilli for Wahoo's 24-7. He's Greg Medea for the Daily Progress. And we're talking about Virginia hoops. And right before the break, we're talking about the small ball lineup. And one of the keys to how, why the small ball lineup is working is because of two men that have really stepped up big, Greg, this season. We have Reese Beekman and Kihei Clark. And Virginia has, has had, in the five-game winning streak, 85 to assists to just 36 turnovers. I mean, those guys have been playing well and they've been moving the ball well and it speaks volumes to how much K. Clark has grown for this fifth season in the UVA uniform and how much Reese Beekman's health, like you mentioned before the break, has really changed the outlook for UVA. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And it's funny, like going back to the ACC tip-off, the media day in Charlotte, I can remember talking to Kihei Clark about one of the things he felt he needed to clean up in this extra go around at, at UVA. And he said it was the turnovers. He said at times last season, he felt like he was trying to do too much because he was the older guy, the guy who had been around, the guy who had played, won a national championship. And he, he felt like it was on him to lead the team and make plays. And 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 he felt like he had to clean up some of those issues and, and be a little more selective and not make as many of those, those turnover mistakes. And he said he worked hard and, and, and was diligent this off season. And also he felt like the team had matured too, like Gardner and, and Beekman and Franklin, the guys around him, he was used to playing with. And he said that, that he felt because of that, he felt like he could uh, minimize some of those turnovers and he's done a really good job. Uh, Beekman too, of course, the way they distribute the basketball is just outstanding. And there's a chemistry there. Uh, there's there's cohesion. Uh, one of the reasons why Tony Bennett's sticking with that small ball lineup, as we mentioned, and and you can see it with the way they play. They know where they're going to be on the court. Uh, they know how the offense is, should look like and how it should flow. And I think you're seeing that uh, because of those two veteran guys uh, in the backcourt. And I think you, you think about March, right? <laughs> Virginia's playing so well that you can start to think about March and seeding and possible tournament matchups. If you have those two guys in your backcourt, you're, you're set up as well as anyone for, for, for postseason play that time of year uh, because of their experience, because of what they can provide, uh, not only with the assist, but but those guys can score too. And I think you've seen Kihei even score it more uh, at times this season also, try to be a little bit more aggressive. I think his decision-making, right, Jackie, I look at that Virginia Tech game and his aggressiveness at times to take layups when they were there instead of passing the ball or to, to kick the ball out uh, and find somebody open for three uh, and to have guys that are confident in shooting the three uh, has made a big time difference with Nikia Clark this season. It's kind of what we said earlier, even for, for Armand Franklin is when all the guys have confidence in each other, that there's other, there's other outlets for, offense is not just one guy which frees up Kihei Clark because like you said he felt like he had the team on his back last year some points so it frees up everyone everyone plays better and you talk about March so let's take a look at the schedule for the Virginia men honestly it's a pretty nice way to end the season I know when you're when I know they go to Syracuse they play the in-state rival again at Blacksburg and Virginia Tech on on February 4th and they I know they travel to um, North Carolina but Honestly, this is a, a nice schedule considering they have Clemson at home um, and Duke at home. It's it's not a bad, a bad way to go into March and tournaments and postseason play. Yeah, right. You get BC twice. One of the, uh, I guess you'd call them, I don't know if it's right to call them a bottom feeder, but one of the, the teams that are they're not, not probably thought of as a contender in the league. You get BC twice. You play Syracuse again, who you've already beaten. Uh, and that, that game really uh, was a game Virginia took control of against the Orange and, and played pretty well. I thought that, that small ball lineup works against that that two three zone, or at least did uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, at, at JPJ. And I mean, NC State uh, they've been they've been good at times. They've been up and down. Duke is not what it was last season in, in John Shire's first year uh, at the helm of the Blue Devils. Uh, and, and Carolina, right? You, you want to see what that matchup looks like with Baycott on the floor. I think that's that's the one that you kind of circle and you think, eh, 
Baycott gave them such trouble last season uh, that whether it was the game in, in Chapel Hill or the game uh, in Brooklyn in the ACC tournament, uh, that, that you, you want to see what it looks like when, when he's on the floor. Uh, but other than that, right, you get Louisville twice. Uh, that's, that's, that's not bad, uh, considering how bad the Cardinals are uh, this, this season. So uh, the schedule does set up quite nicely. Yeah, then, and honestly, let's say the last three games, because usually that's when you I kind of want to, that's where you're just kind of seeding the last few games. It's at North Carolina, Clemson at home, and Louisville at home. I mean, just playing at home also against who, you know, top 20 Clemson, that that is nice yeah. to have that opportunity to to kind of close it out before the ACC tournament starts on March 7th. That's that's coming. That's coming real quick. <laughs> um, So Virginia men on the way up. Unfortunately, the Virginia women are going the opposite direction, but not so much because of the program going that direction, but just the season, just the way their schedule, unlike the men, their schedule has been very, very, very challenging because they face like a number of ranked opponents and they still are going to face a number of ranked opponents. This Sunday, they're going to face the 12th ranked Hokies. They still have got the currently 20, 20th ranked NC State on the docket. They still have numbers. 16 Duke. They still have a challenging matchup against Miami, um, number 15th UNC. So, I mean, they still have a, quite a challenging AC schedule without Miriam McLean. I think I would be speaking about the UVA women's schedule a little differently if she was not out for the season. Don't get me wrong, Yontavon has done a good job stepping in and has shown some good bright spots for them. But without McLean, that's, that's been the, the X factor for me, Greg. Yeah, I mean, she at the time of her injury, she was leading UVA in in points and rebounds per game. That that, that kind of tells you her her value on the floor. Uh, even though she was not the the tallest player, she was excellent on the glass. She found a way to get rebounds. She found a way to scrap for the ball, and then her her scoring really really a knack for for putting the ball in the basket close to the rim. Uh, she had a good feel for that, and it was really showing her comfort. Uh, at Virginia, right? She had transferred in from from Connecticut uh, the season before, mid midway through the season. Actually, had played in some games for UConn, which is crazy in itself. Uh, at the beginning of the 21-22 season, transferred to Virginia and then played for the uh, Cavaliers. Uh, you know, after she transferred, she had played for two teams uh, in that season. That was not easy. I remember her telling me earlier this year. Uh, but you, you look at, at what she had done, and, and she was really starting to show her talent level, her skill, and how she fit uh, in Coach Amaka Google Hamilton's uh, system, right? I thought that was really important. So they've been needing players to step up in her absence. Uh, and, and talking a little bit with Coach Mox uh, yesterday on a Zoom ahead of their, their trip to Syracuse, uh, she said, you know, they, they've done a better job trying to rebound it collectively, that it's got to be a total team effort on the boards. I think – they're, they're missing the offense, though. Cam Taylor's had to step up. She's been pretty good throughout the year, but they need her even more to score the basketball now. Uh, they missed Sam Brunel the other day against Notre Dame, uh, and that, that game was – that's that's a tough matchup without a player who played there and, and you expect it to have. Uh, so it, it'll be good for them to get Sam back. Uh, but I think this, this schedule is just absolutely brutal. They've lost six of eight, uh, but all six losses are to teams currently ranked in the top 25. Yeah, that was unfortunate for Sam to miss that game against Notre Dame. And what was yeah. a, let's just put it mildly, an interesting call for fighting um, on that <laughs> one. If you watched the replay, it was, uh, I don't know if that was fighting, then I'm, I, 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 then I have to give my kids more timeouts um, because that was, <laughs> that was quite, that was quite interesting. But this is not an indictment to what Coach Mox is building. Because I know it's like they haven't won. Um, they were they've lost six out of eight. This is just a great rebound for this team, regardless of what they've what this team has been doing the last few years. And the excitement level around the program still continues. I know I've taken my kids as fans. Uh, my my daughter loves basketball, so she wanted to see a basketball game. So I took her to the women's basketball game against Boston College, and the environment is so good there yeah. right now. People are really interested in the game. And, you know, the one thing that, I, you know, people are still talking about, you know, I was talking to people waiting in the concession stands. I never get to do that when I go <laughs> to the beat, but when I was in the concession stand, um, they're really excited about the future. You know, Kamara Johnson was, you know, just nominated for the All-American McDonald's game. Actually, no, she was selected. Olivia McGee was nominated, but she wasn't selected. So you've got two local girls who are going to be part of the women's team 
next year, joining Sam Brunel, who still has a year of eligib eligibility left if she chooses. So you're going to have three local women, three highly ranked women playing for this team. So, Greg, this, this program is getting a lot of energy, and it's going the right direction, although it's not going to show in the wins-losses this year. Yeah, I, I I I agree with that 100%. Like, you go to the games, and the lower bowl is – is pretty packed, uh, at least for for some of the games that I've covered. Uh, you know, you see the energy. It's it, you know, it's a different it's a different type of crowd than the men's crowd. I'd say you know it's very family oriented. A lot of community uh, folks out and about at the games, and I I, I kind of liken it to the baseball the crowd the baseball mm -hmm. uh, team gets in the spring at at the, at the dish. And, and to me, I think it's a it's a great atmosphere. And she is uh, Coach Mox is is building something. And even she said, you know. It, you got to remember, this team lost a lot of games last year. Uh, she had said that yesterday on the Zoom call, and and the team is still learning how to win in these, you know, in these ACC games against really really good competition. Like they had third quarter leads in a couple of those games uh, that they lost to, to teams that are ranked, uh, but got outscored in the fourth quarter. I think it was the the Florida State game. It was like twenty eight to eight in the fourth quarter, even though they had led after three. I want to say the the North North Carolina game might have been similar. I'd have to go back and look at that to be exact. Maybe twenty-seven to eight in the fourth quarter, outscored after leading through three. That's that's really really tough, right? Because you feel like you're right there and you're in some of those games, uh, but then you, you you don't have the, the ability to finish the job. Uh, so maybe that's that's what the next step of that the program will be. Whether it's later this season, they they start to figure it out. The women's tournament is the week before in Greensboro, ahead of the men's tournament. Uh, maybe they figure it out then, or or maybe it's the off season and, and next year. Uh, but the, the the overwhelming theme with the women's program is it's it's definitely trending in the right direction. Yeah, and then definitely the excitement level is there for both Virginia men and Virginia women. So, Greg, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Yeah, happy to do it, Jackie. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for joining us on the show to talk some hoops today. So that was nice to kind of catch up and talk about both the men and women's program, both of them uh, getting some excitement from fans and uh, to where the programs are headed. Um, obviously, this weekend, there is still football news, so I'm just going to touch on just a few things. Obviously, that is junior day. And so, so far, it's been kind of quiet as far as who's visiting and who's not yet. We are still working on confirming a few other players that had told us that they were interested in visiting, but we have yet to confirm that they're actually visiting. Sometimes it's about rides and sometimes it's last minute. So a lot of them are going to be coming to that junior day on Saturday. You know, we talked about the men's basketball team. They're going to have a game at Boston college and often teams like having a basketball game to take recruits on. It just happens that Virginia men's basketball have been on the road on the weekend. So this is the first big opportunity for UVA football to host a junior day when they can play uh, where they can take the recruits to the John Paul Jones Arena. And that's always great to have that environment to show them and show that the great facilities at JPJ. So it's always nice to take the guys there. So we have been able to confirm a few guys like Edge Jared Johnson and Dinwiddie athlete Harry Dalton. Those are the two bigger names that we've been able to confirm as far as, as guys that are expected at the junior day. Now, Virginia is competing with other junior days. And that's been kind of the issue that UV has run into. And this weekend, Penn state is having an event. Once again, last junior day, UVA was also competing with Penn state. So they're competing with Penn state once again, and they're also competing with Duke and Duke is also hosting a number of local in-state athletes for that junior day. And one of the guys that we have confirmed is going there is Salem linebacker, Chris Cole, Chris Cole, who picked up an offer from UVA. The last week is being recruited by Clint Sintum. And you guys know how I feel about Clint Sintum's recruiting. He's being recruited by Chris Cole. And, uh, he's, rec he's recruiting Chris Cole. So I don't see anything about him not being able to visit. This was a situation where he had already cemented a visit to Duke. He had visited Virginia Tech on Monday for their Duke game. When they played Virginia Tech, uh, Duke had Virginia Duke. If I could speak, that would be great. When uh, Virginia Tech hosted Duke basketball. Uh, Virginia Tech hosted a junior day with a lot of them and Chris Cole and his team, Peyton Lewis. Both of them visited Virginia Tech. Now, um, I did speak to Peyton Lewis. He wasn't set for a visit to Duke this weekend. He actually says he's going to visit James Madison on Sunday. Um, and then Chris Cole told me that he will be at Duke on Saturday. Now, both of them, both 
St. Louis, who's a running back out of Salem High School, and Chris Cole both told me that they're going to be visiting Virginia in the spring. So we're going to see a lot of these guys are going to be visiting Virginia in the spring. So although the if I'm still trying to confirm visitors, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more in-depth coverage of the visitor preview list by tomorrow, which usually I get a lot more of these confirmations on Thursday evening. So when you look at the junior day visitor lists, you also have to take some mindful kind of steps and look at the spring because that's when you really want to see a lot of the guys and you want to see them coming into spring practice. You also want to try to cement some early feelers for those summer official visits. Both Chris and Peyton both said that they're interested in summer official visits. Chris Cole actually said that he is also considering early enrolling kind of depends on where things stand, how he feels. And obviously which schools will allow that too. Um, he's a high academic kid, so I don't see a problem with uh, academics being there, but that's something that he's considering too. So summer officials is going to play a key role here for UVA. So again, junior day, we've, we've gotten two good in-state players. I think you need to get in Harry Dalton pretty early. I know he's only a 2025 athlete, but if you want a chance of Harry Dalton, you need to get in on him early, considering South Carolina has already offered and Beamer has done a good job in the state of Virginia. And Jared Johnson, a 2024 edge, is also one that holds an offer. So they're in early, and that's one that you want to uh, kind of continue to be on that trajectory. So we'll have full coverage of the junior day and those visitors. So hopefully... Um, we'll have more of an idea tonight. So I will be posting a preview to the junior days on what I was 24 seven on Friday. And then we always talk to the junior day visitors after they leave ground. So look for those probably Sunday or Monday, since I'll be covering the Virginia men's basketball game at noon, um, against Boston college. So when I have a basketball game and junior day, junior day visitors reactions tend to go about 24 hours later in most of those cases. So um, so yeah, so uh, that's all we have time for today. That was a lot of information. We covered men's basketball, women's basketball, and a little bit of football recruiting. So we will be right back here on Tuesday for our recruiting focused show. Again, we'll be talking about junior days. We'll also be looking ahead to National Signing Day, which will be on uh, Wednesday. I know it's hard to believe another signing day where we do expect Virginia to sign. We still are on commitment watch. Um, at this moment on Wahoo's 24-7. I think Virginia is going to be landing a very talented athlete um very very soon so we're still on commitment watch so we're covering national sign today so we'll cover all that stuff on tuesday we'll break down um and i'll actually start breaking down some 2024 names on tuesday kind of looking ahead as well because they're not going to sign that many players on wednesday so i want to start looking ahead at 2024 and i'll have a breakdown of all the guys that virginia is recruiting and there are a number that i think virginia are sitting in a very good spot including highland springs quarterback christian martin so I'll have all that on Tuesday. So again, if you like what you're hearing, make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcast. Why not also like this YouTube channel, click on a bell so that you are notified whenever a new video is posted. And if you head over to Spotify and Apple, leave us a review and rate us. It'll help us with the algorithm and help us continue to build this show so that we can possibly continue to add more shows during the week and maybe more staff too on Wild 24 7. So thanks again for listening and I hope you guys have a great weekend.